Thank you both. Um, yeah, that's uh, very exciting that they're going to be able to go on that mission trip. So um, if you would like to uh, donate and help that happen, uh, they'll be outside. And also, if you want to donate, you can just want to make a quick note. You can donate directly to the church and just say that you want to uh, donate for Zaley's mission trip. And uh, we'll make sure that it goes to the right place. Um, well, good morning. It's, uh, it's good to see you all here post-Thanksgiving. Um, I hope Thanksgiving was a good time for you all. I hope that uh, if you were with family, that it felt like you were with actual family and not uh, being divided over uh, different arguments. Uh, I saw one video where they said, hey, some homes have a, a, a kid's table. We have a Democrat table. So I don't know if that was you or not, but hopefully, hopefully you felt unified and, and you felt like it was a good time for Thanksgiving. Um, Hopefully. And it, if you didn't, if you spent it alone, you weren't able to spend it with friends or family or loved ones, uh, I hope that you remember that you're, you're never alone with God and that you also have a community here that uh, we, we love you and we want to support you and be there for you. So uh, I hope, however it looked, that it was a good, good Thanksgiving. The, the nice thing about Thanksgiving is, for Adventists at least, that it's always on Thursday. So there's always that day uh, to, to kind of sleep in and uh, get, the, get the rest. Um, unless, of course, you're into Black Friday uh, shopping. So uh, if you did go Black Friday shopping, I hope, I hope you're still awake today and have, have some energy this morning. Um, but speaking of shopping, a couple weeks ago, uh, there were two influencers, uh, celebrity influencers, that uh, decided to go to Walmart. And uh, it made quite a stir online. These two celebrity influencers, they're sisters, and they had a sponsorship, a partnership, uh, with a new kind of snack. And as celebrities do, they went to uh, sponsor this product and to say, hey, look, it's, it's us, we're the celebrities, we like these snacks, you should get them too. This sponsorship was also in partnership with Walmart. So what they did was they said, hey, as long as we're sponsoring it, let's make a fun, fun TikTok, let's make some fun videos, and we'll share that. And so being the celebrities with the, the amount of influence that they have, they were able to get the Walmart vests and uniforms, and they went and they took photos and videos of them looking photogenic as they restocked the shelves with the new snack and as they directed traffic and uh, they were smiling and laughing as they helped customers buying their new product and uh, all good fun. But believe it or not, uh, the internet can have at times some strong opinions. And uh, the opinions on this incident were not too favorable to, to say the least. Um, in fact, the internet was full of people that were actually really upset that these celebrities had done this video pretending to be Walmart workers and taking these uh, different photos and videos. The, the top comment under Charlie D'Amelio's uh, comment section, the number one liked comment, it said this, just to give you an idea of what people were feeling and why people were upset. The top comment said, I wish I had enough money to cosplay as a retail worker, so fun being in the working class. <laughs> Basically, they're saying, I wish I had enough money that I could pretend to go work a minimum wage job and then go home to sleep in my mansion afterwards. <laughs> there was something upsetting to people who actually have to work retail or minimum wage jobs to survive, to make a living, about somebody who was wealthy and doesn't need to do that job, uh, dressing up and playing pretend and um, smiling as they are helping customers through the register because, of course, if you've ever worked customer service, you know that everybody's always smiling and satisfied and uh, never upset about the smallest thing uh, imaginable. Um, and I don't want to be overdramatic about this because I'm sure it was uh, in, in fun and, and good intentions. 
Um, and it's also, it's not the first time a celebrity's done something like this. You've probably seen the videos of maybe LeBron James making pizza or Ed Sheeran working as a Starbucks barista. It's, it's a kind of a cool thing. And, and maybe if you were uh, in that pizza shop or in that uh, coffee store or at Walmart and you saw these people, you'd be like, oh, that's cool. You uh, get to meet a celebrity unexpectedly. But for the people that worked retail or minimum wage jobs that were upset online, the reason they were upset was because they recognized something. They recognized that the people that these celebrities, they were putting on their work uniform, the same work uniform they would put on, but they were putting it on for different reasons. And I think this morning we want to ask the question, we want to have a pause to ask the question, what is it that we are serving from? If we're serving at all, what is the place that we're serving from? Because those retail workers who were upset, they recognize that they serve in those uniforms for different reasons than those celebrities do. And that's an extreme example. And again, I don't want to over dramatize it, but I do think it should give us pause to ask this question. They were serving for completely different reasons. A few weeks ago, if you were here, and if you weren't, that's totally okay, but if you were here, we talked about John chapter 15 and the idea that Jesus lays out a job description for what his disciples are going to be doing in their daily lives. Basically, if you want to be a disciple, if you want to be a follower of Christ, here's what you're going to be doing. And so he lays out the three items that he, he says, here's what's going to be happening. Here's your three priorities. And the first one is that you abide, you stay connected to Jesus. The second one is that you love others. You, you love others from the outpouring of your connection with Jesus. And then you also bear witness, basically. You share with others the goodness of your experience, of what it means to be connected to Jesus and to be loving others from that. But this morning, I want to take a step back from that. Um, I also just want to say I've had several of you that uh, have been coming up to me, and you've been reciting those three things to me. So please keep th that up. I love it. Uh, keep seeing how you can work that abiding, loving, and bearing witness in, in your daily life. Um, but this morning, I want to step back and get some context for that. Because just two chapters before, in John chapter 13, Jesus does something interesting. And what he does is before he says, hey, here's what your job description is going to be, he says, before you can even think about being my disciple, there's something that I need you to get through your head. There's something that you need to understand. There's a qualification of what it takes to be a disciple of Christ before you can even think about, okay, how am I going to do this on a daily basis? In John chapter 13, two chapters before, Jesus uh, tells his disciples about what that qualification is. And the way he does it is he takes the time to wash their feet. He washes their feet, and then he gives them the qualification. He says, before we go work on the life of being a disciple, here's what we're going to be doing. And so if we look at John 13, verses uh, 12 through 15, Jesus says this. You want to throw the last verse up there. Do you understand what I have done for you, to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For just as I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Basically, Jesus says he wants them to recognize two things. Now you can put that next slide up. The two things he wants them to recognize is, one, that it was Jesus, their Lord, their Master, their Rabbi that washed their feet, and two, that they should be thinking about following his example and washing the feet of others. Before Jesus tells them, hey, I'm going to leave you, but don't worry, I'll come back someday. Before Jesus says, hey, when I leave you, I'm going to leave a helper called the Holy Spirit that's going to be able to help guide you in through your daily life and with your conscience and the decisions you're going to be making to give you strength and hope. Before Jesus tells them how they can abide with him as they live in their daily lives, Jesus says, I want to make sure you guys notice something. He says, do you understand what I have just done to you? 
He wants to, them to realize that Jesus, their teacher and their Lord and their rabbi and their master and their savior, washed their feet. He wants them to recognize that. And then the second thing is he wants them to be thinking, how can I follow that example and how can I be serving to wash the feet of others? If you're at all familiar with the character of Jesus, it probably doesn't surprise you that he was kind of big on this idea of service. As Adventists, from an Adventist perspective, this is something that was baked in early on to our theology. But I think also, like many things, when we build up our, our doctrines and what we believe, sometimes the, the main focus can get set aside or get a little muddled. But I want to share with you something that Ellen White wrote in The Desire of Ages about John chapter 13. She's talking specifically about the words that Jesus just spoke. Says, she says, this ideal of ministry God has committed to his son. Jesus was given to stand at the head of humanity that by his example, he might teach what it means to minister. His whole life was under a law of service. He served all, he ministered to all. Thus, he lived the law of God and by his example showed how we are to obey it. Jesus lived a life of service and he calls us to do the same. Ellen White says that God thought, hey, I'm going to give my son, I'm going to give Jesus the mission to do the ideal of ministry. So that way, all people who want to follow me, who want to have a relationship with me, they can look to my son and they can say, oh, okay, that's how we're supposed to be doing it. That's the ideal of ministry right there. And the way that Jesus fulfilled it was to live a life of service. So when Jesus calls his disciples to follow his example, he's not just saying, do as I do or follow me. He's saying, do as I do what God sees as the ideal of ministry. Follow me and you will be fulfilling the law of God. Follow my example. See how I serve others with humility and do likewise. Jesus says, before you can live the life of a disciple, before you can abide, you love, and you bear witness, you need to be ready to serve. Not just serving out of responsibility or feeling like you have to serve or you have to be doing certain things. You should be serving out of gratitude. Gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for you. In Matthew 18, Jesus shares a parable about an ungrateful servant. An ungrateful servant who owes his master, a king, a great sum of money, a lot of money. And the ungrateful servant, he comes before the king, his master, and he says, Master, please have mercy on me. I, I will get the money back to you. I will find a way to pay you back. I know it's an incredible amount of money, and nobody knows how I could make this money back, but please give me a chance. Give me some more time. Don't send me to prison. Don't have me executed. Please give me a chance. And the king, his master, replies, and he says, don't worry. I'm in a forgiving mood. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm not just going to have pity on you to say, I'll give you some more time. He says, I'm going to have full on mercy on you to give you something you don't deserve. I'm going to pardon your debt completely. I'm going to turn you in to a debt free man. A merciful act, an act that the ungrateful servant, who his name will explain more in a minute here, didn't deserve, but received anyways, a gift freely given a merciful act to pardon his debt. So the servant, he, he says, thank you so much, master. Thank you so much, my king. He says, I'm so grateful to you. He's professing gratitude for what has been done for him. And he goes out from the king's presence professing gratitude. And as he goes out from the palace, from his master's presence, he comes across a man. And the man whom he comes across is another man who owes the servant money. And Jesus makes the note in this parable that we should recognize that the money that the man owed the servant is significantly less than what the servant owed the king. Significantly less. The man says, please, Mr. Servant, sir, 
Please, give me some more time. Have mercy on me. I, I'll find a way to get the money back to you. Please, have mercy on me. But the servant doesn't. He says, how could you not have the money ready? How could you not be ready to pay off your debt? Don't you know how this works? We don't just forgive debts around here. He calls the guards and he says, take this man and have him thrown in jail because he can't pay his debt back to me. Some servants of the king, some other servants of the master, they see this and they're greatly distressed, it says. They go to the king, to the, their master, and they say, hey, uh, you remember that guy that you uh, pardoned his debt, you forgave his debt? He just did the opposite of that to somebody else. So the king has him brought back in, and he says to the servant, he says to the servant, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that, you, all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? You see, the man in the, the story of the ungrateful servant, he missed something. The servant missed something because while he professed gratitude, he only got about half of what gratitude actually is. There's something important here that he missed that I don't want us to miss this morning. He got one half of gratitude, but he missed the other half. Because you see, gratitude requires two things. It requires two things. One, it requires recognition of what has been done for you. And two, it requires a life lived which reflects the gratitude you have for what has been done for you. You see, the servant, he only got the first part down. He was more than happy to have his master serve him, to have his master show mercy to him, to have his master say, hey, I'm going to forgive your debt. You're okay. You don't have to worry about that anymore, he said. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. But when it came to the second part, a life lived that expresses uh, gratitude for what has been done for you, a life that lives, that shows understanding of what has been done to you, a life that requires showing mercy to others the way that mercy has been shown to you, he said, not so much, not so much. When Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, he calls them to have true gratitude, true gratitude. He's calling them to serve but he's calling them to serve for the right reasons. He says, if you truly understand what I have done for you and to you, you will both accept that your Lord, your master, your rabbi, your teacher, your savior has washed your feet. You will accept that that act has been done for you. And you will also seek to do it to the others as you go out from here. You will go and do likewise. The ungrateful servant, if Jesus had washed his feet, he would have said, thank you very much, now my feet are clean. But he would not have seek, sought to go and do likewise. He failed to live out of gratitude. He failed to live that gratitude, and instead he chose what we would call a selfish kind of gratitude. Gratitude for what's been done for you, but not willing to give it to anybody else. Jesus calls us to not only accept the gift of grace and mercy and love that has been freely given to us, but he calls us to freely give it to others as well. He calls us to accept true gratitude, to accept what Jesus did for you, and accept the call to serve others. I think the call to serve has been somewhat set aside in Christianity at large today. I think, especially post-COVID, it is incredibly easy for us to consume church, but not to serve. I think it is easy for us to roll out of bed in our pajamas and turn on the live stream and be reminded of what God has done for us and say, thank you very much. I needed that reminder. Thank you, God. And then we go back to our lives and go about our business like nothing happened. 
Jesus calls us to not only recognize what he has done for us, to accept that Jesus loves you, that God created you and made you special and with a purpose, that Jesus died for you so that you could have the gift of eternal life and you could have grace available to you. He says, accept that, but then also go and do likewise. I think as many of us, we're going to serve in different ways with different capacities and abilities and limitations that we all have. And all of us struggle with service and that desire to serve or how we're going to serve uh, because I think a lot of us, we've seen uh, people burn out and we're worried that, oh, I don't want to get over involved. I don't want to overextend myself. So we just decide We'll accept the first part, but not the second part of gratitude. But I think the reverse is possible as well. I think it's, it's possible to accept the call to serve, but not do it from a place of gratitude. Does that make sense? As a pastor, I can say this, that it's possible to be attending meetings and putting on programs and even preaching and be doing it from a place of, oh, this is my job, this is my responsibility, I have to do it, and not be saying, oh, I'm doing this because I have so much gratitude for what God has done for me in my life, and I want to share that with other people. The second your service is from a place of, I have to do this, you're in trouble. Service needs to be, I want to do this out of gratitude. Or at the very least, I accept the call that Jesus has given me to do something because of the gratitude I have for what he did for me. So where are you serving from in your life? Because Jesus made a call to serve. And while, like I said, service looks different for everybody. Some of us uh, have different abilities and limitations. Some of us are younger and some of us are older. Some of us have different uh, financial brackets that we can work with. We all have different resources and things that are available to us. But Jesus still calls you to full and true gratitude. How are you seeking to serve from where you can serve? How are you seeking to serve from gratitude? And if you are serving, are you serving from gratitude? Or are you serving from something else? It can be difficult and it can be daunting to think about the idea of service. It can be scary to think, oh, Jesus calls me to serve. He doesn't just call me to accept what he's done for me. He calls me to live a life that lives out love and service for the people around me. But what I have found is the key to living this out. You want to put that slide up again? The three things that you can do in your daily life. You can abide. You stay connected with Christ. Two, you love others. You seek to love others out of your connection with Christ. And three, you bear witness. You share the goodness of what's been done for you. You see, this is the job description. This is what it takes to live a daily life as a disciple of Christ. But what Jesus says in chapter 13 is he simply says, I'm calling you to something. I want you to recognize that I have given you a gift. I have given you a gift of grace, of mercy, the ability to be free from sin, the ability to spend all of eternity with me if you choose to have a relationship with me. I'm giving you that that gift, the way that the king gave the servant the gift of being debt-free. Jesus has given you a gift, and he says, I call you to not only accept that gift, but to serve. All you have to do right now is to accept Jesus' call. Accept the call to true gratitude. Accept what Jesus did for you. Accept the call to serve others from a place of gratitude. That's the qualification that's what it takes to be a true disciple before anything else. If you want to be somebody that's truly serving and not just somebody that's throwing on the uniform and taking some pics and pretending to look good in, in the pew, if you want to be a true disciple, you have to accept what Jesus has done for you and you have to accept the call to serve. And after that acceptance, you can live the life of a disciple. The only way you can do that without 
either losing interest in serving or burning yourself out, is to abide. It's to stay connected to God. It's to love others. Jesus says in this same chapter in John 13, he says that verse I love so much, a new commandment I give to you. They will know you are my disciples by the love which you have for one another. And then three, you bear witness. You serve. You don't just serve just before you have a relationship with God. You don't serve just because you feel like you have to. You serve from gratitude. You serve from love. I pray that our church will be a church of true gratitude. One that accepts what Jesus did for us and continues to do for us. And one that answers his call to serve. If we can do that, if we can do those two things, watch what Jesus will do with our church and with our community. I can't wait to see how God will use his disciples here as we move forward. Let's all answer that call together. Amen.